Please put your hands together for Desi Tabati Ventura. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, I guess you moderate. I do. Well, please, if you have questions, please line up right over there. We, we have a gentleman with a microphone. I'll be happy to take your questions. I just want to know, um, I know as a wrestler, it's very taxing, very trying on the body, but you use that to segue into films and, and other projects. Was that the plan from the beginning, or was that something? I, I have never had a plan for anything in my life. <laughs> I, I never sat down at one point in my life and charted out the next 20 years. I let things happen. I, I follow the teachings on that of Yogi Berra. And Yogi Berra, the great Yankee catcher of old, many of you probably don't even know who he was, he had some great one-liners. And one of them was, when you come to a Y in the road, take it. <laughs> and that's kind of how I've lived my life. When I've approached a Y in the road, I take it. And then I don't look back. And I wait until the next Y in the road comes along. And then I decide on that one. I had no intention of ever getting into politics. At one time, I had no intention of being a pro wrestler. Uh, didn't even have any intention at one point of being a Navy SEAL. All of these things kind of fell into place. I'm, I'm, I'm a great believer sometimes in fate and destiny a little bit. And I think fate and destiny play somewhat a role for whatever reason it might be. And that one thing leads you to another and some things can be terrible. Like the night before I was to wrestle Hulk Hogan for the world heavyweight title in Los Angeles, I ended up in critical condition in the San Diego hospital with massive blood clots in my lungs from 28 days of flying in a row. And I had to recover from that. I was in critical condition. My wife even had to fly out. And uh, when I did recover from it, I then faced something that, as an athlete, you know it's going to happen, but you never want to face it, and that is Father Time. When is it over? And then what do you do when it's over? What am I going to do? I'm a pro wrestler. You think they're going to hire me at General Mills? <laughs> you know, you put that on your resume, put you right in the top of the list for an executive job, right? <laughs> Maybe today it would, but not then. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and so I was faced with that dilemma, and the point I'm getting to is that many times in life when something dastardly happens to you, it leads to something good as a result of it. And what did this, I never got my shot at Hogan. Never got my, and I was going all around with him, three match program would have made me a ton of money. Never got to do it. But what did I get to do? While I was convalescing, Vince McMahon called me and he said, Jesse, I have an idea. And I said, what is it, Vince? He said, we've never had a villain on the microphone before. He said, you think you could do color commentating and broadcast matches? I said, I know I can. And so Vince said, I'm going to do it. We're going to put the first bad guy on the mic. Somebody who sides with the, the bad guys. You can't believe how successful that was. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And all I did was tell the truth. When a guy pulled hair, I explained how talented he was to hide it from the ref. <laughs> and everybody at home said, he's right. <laughs> so it worked out very well. But there's a case of adversity leading me then into the broadcasting end, which led me down the road, and I'll take that one step farther. Many people have asked me, how did I become governor? I can assure you, pro wrestling is a phenomenal practice field. I'm serious. Number one, 
You have to be able to think on your feet quickly because anything that can go wrong will go wrong in the match, Murphy's Law, and you need to be able to adapt fast so it doesn't wreck the match. Second of all, you've got to learn how to talk in front of people, right? Because you've got to sell the matches. And third, gee, I used to get people so pissed off, they'd pay their hard-earned money to see me. When I run for political office, all I'm asking for is a vote, that's free, and show up. It worked well. You know, it worked well. And because, why wouldn't you vote? It don't cost nothing. You know? Very, very true. And, and so, that's a great, you know, transitioning as a wrestler, in a, as a wrestler, I had to work to get all you to pay your hard-earned money to see me get my ass kicked. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Well, I'm not asking you to do anything as a politician except go out and give me your vote. Don't cost nothing. <laughs> Ticket costs money. <laughs> so it worked well. And I made the transition. A lot of people don't realize I was a mayor before I was a governor. I was a mayor of Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, the sixth, uh, I believe it was the sixth largest city at the time in the state of Minnesota, first ring suburb of Minneapolis. So I had four years of experience, and I can say this, at the ground level. Because when you're a mayor, you're sitting with the people like I am now. You got a city council meeting every week. You got to look the people right in the eye. That teaches you how to govern. Then I went to governor, and of course, then you don't see anybody unless you wanna. See, they isolate themselves the higher they get from you, so they don't have to answer your questions. <laughs> see, I learn when I'm in there too. But, uh, you know, so uh, the transition from wrestling to politics was actually, I think, pro wrestling was very beneficial for politics, because you're selling yourself in wrestling, and you're selling yourself in politics. Same thing. By the way, I got a question for all you. You notice I'm not on any television in the United States now, because I'm pretty well banned. They don't like what I talk about. They don't like the questions I ask. So I'll ask you one today. Please explain to me the difference between Putin's invasion of Ukraine and our invasion of Iraq. Somebody tell me what was different. Why was ours considered okay and Russia's not? The only, they're both for the same thing, regime change. Same thing. We want to change who is governing Iraq. Putin wanted to change who is governing Ukraine. Now, don't get me wrong, I didn't support either war. They both suck. But everybody, you notice our national media doesn't bring that up at all, do they? And you notice they brought up, when, now the, Fed, or the international courts have made it so Putin can't travel now because he's considered a war criminal. Let's not forget the international courts did the same thing with Bush and Cheney after the invasion of Iraq. Why do you think George Bush can't leave the U.S.? He could be arrested in the international because we don't abide by it either. So that's why I'm not on TV, everyone, <laughs> because Jesse brings up things that they don't want talked about. That's why I'll give a f shameless plug. I'm on Substack now, and my show is called Die First Then Quit. Now, where did that come from? Well, that's a slogan in the first phase of Navy SEAL training. Before you go out the door, you see a sign that says, Die First Then Quit. Because they're trying to make you quit. It's part of the training. But it applies to me and my new show in this aspect. It means I'm going to die first before I quit talking. And I'm going to keep talking, and I'm going to keep calling out hypocrisy every chance I see. And the only thing in the end that's going to stop me is when I die. 
Well, you know, I get that a lot, and I'll just say this to you. If there's a party out there that has ballot access in all 50 states, and they come to me, I don't want to go through no primaries, I don't want to do any of the bullshit. If they come to me and say, we want you as a presidential or vice presidential candidate for our party, and they have ballot access in all 50 states, only one other question I would have to worry about is, can I get in the debates? Because I have to be in the debates to win, and I don't go in not to win. And so, if there's a party that has ballot access in all 50 states, if they were to choose me, rest assured, I'll get in the debates. <laughs> I have a question over here. Yep. Jesse, uh, having grown up in Illinois and back in the territory days, our exposure to wrestling was only through the AWA. Sure. I just wondered what your thoughts were on the legacy of Vern Gagne's contribution to pro wrestling and guys like Nick Bockwinkel and Dick the Bruiser. Oh, they, will, were, they were huge. Will they be lost to time, though? Well, no, they were huge for then. Back in the territory days, you had 26 territories throughout the United States all with their own wrestling. And the AWA, as he's talking about, they were huge in the Midwest, Chicago, Milwaukee, Denver, Minneapolis, Winnipeg, all that. But, and they were one of the top three big organizations because you had Charlotte, New York, and Minneapolis. Those were like the big three, you know, that you had then. And then, of course, Vince did his power play and went across the country and asserted himself, and he became number one. I was part of that because at that point I was fed up with the business and I thought it's this or nothing. It's time to burn the bridges, go for broke. If it fails, all right, I'm prepared to leave wrestling. I'll be blackballed everywhere. No one will use me. But then again, don't count on that. Because the one thing about wrestling, no matter what your transgression is, if they figure they can make money with you, they'll forget about it. <laughs> Yes, he went more. And, and so as far as those people, Vern and all them, they were phenomenal for their era. You know, wrestling was different then. It's changed now. I couldn't participate today because I watch it today, and all it is is tumbling and street fighting. I don't know why it's called wrestling because nobody takes a hold, and in my day, all matches started, you circled each other, and you locked up. Locked up. Today, nobody locks up. And the other difference why I'd have a problem today is that in my day, we had the freedom to create for ourselves who we were going to be. You had that freedom of creativity. Today, you got a bunch of writers that pick out a Marvel comic character and then they pick out a body to make that guy this. You're going to become this. And, you got, and, and I don't think that does nothing for the creativity of a wrestler when you should be creating yourself of who you are. It'll have much better translation and transfer to the people, I think. But that's just Jesse's antiquated old opinion today as being someone over 70 and all the young people think you don't know shit. <laughs> Jesse, one quick qu more yeah. question. What's your best Andre the Giant story? Uh, my best Andre the Giant story is probably the first time I wrestled him. Uh, Topeka, Kansas. Got into the ring with him, locked up with him, locked up, you know. Uh, took, a, took a front face lock on him and didn't help him a bit. He put his hands on my hips. I was 6'4", 260. He put his hands on my hips, pressed me over his head, walked me back to the turnbuckle, set me on the turnbuckle, reached up and patted my cheek. <laughs> and I sat there for a moment and excuse, ladies, excuse my French, but I said, holy shit, nobody has ever picked me up. 
when you wrestled Andre, it was like you wrestling your two-year-old or three-year-old nephew on the living room. You can pick him up, spin him around, do anything with him. Well, that's what Andre could do to you. Pick you up, spin you around, and do anything to you. And you couldn't do nothing. Andre would have won the Olympic gold medal in wrestling without even knowing how to wrestle. What are you going to do with him? Leg dive him? Yeah, right. While you're grabbing his leg, he drops 500 pounds onto your back. <laughs> then you got to remove that. <laughs> no, Chris Taylor, the great wrestler from Iowa State, told me Andre would have won the gold medal, hands down. Andre was what he was, the eighth wonder of the world. I think that covers it. Next you know, question's from Glenn. He was what he was, the eighth wonder. There'll never be another, I don't think. And uh, he was a remarkable man and a great athlete. People don't realize he played soccer in Europe as a kid. The guy was a he just kept growing and then found his niche in the world of pro wrestling. All right, next question. And a from good Glenn. niche it was. Next. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, back in the day, you tried to start a union for the pro wrestlers. Yeah. And now today, with them having the downside guarantees, I don't know anything about their health care and all that. Is this closer to what you were trying to do back in the day? or I, I was simply trying to unionize because all other pro athletes had unions. And what occurred was this. I got on a hotel in Las Vegas. And in, the, in, and in the elevator, Gene Upshaw got on, the former head of the National Football League Player Association, a big guard from the Raiders. And I'll never forget, Gene and I said hi to each other, and Gene looked at me, lifted that big finger of his into the air, and he pointed it at me, and he said, you know, you boys in wrestling need a union. And I said, I know, Gene. And so it got in my craw then, and I... I I then had a union, now I was getting one. I had just signed to do Predator. So I was becoming a member of the Screen Actors Guild. So I stood up in the locker room, none of the management was there, got on the stool and made a speech to the wrestlers. I, it was right before WrestleMania II. I said, now is the time to unionize. If we go to the press, and threaten we're not going to wrestle unless we get union representation. By federal law, they have to let it. And I said, in all these buildings, Vince is going to, who do you think turns the lights on? The unions. If they back us, we can destroy WrestleMania, and we can go to the Charlotte guys and get them to join in with us, and pro wrestling can finally have a union where we can get medical care. At that time, I was paying $6,000 a year for health care for my family. If I had a union, it might only be 1500 No retirement. I saw dozens of wrestlers give 30 years to that business, didn't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of in the end. If you had a union, maybe you could retire on $500 a month something. So I stood on my soapbox. I gave my plea, got home a day later, and Vince called me and ran me through, through the ringer. And I had to quit because he wasn't going to let me do Predator. So I quit. Went down and did Predator. Arnold asked me to do Running Man. Vince sent an embassy down to tell me he needed me back and want to talk to me. I said, not till I'm back. I came back, I signed Running Man. I said, now I'll talk to Vince. You want to know why I waited to sign Running Man first? For ladies, this is called FU money. It's so that when they come at you, you have the ability to tell them F you if you don't like the deal. It's good to have it. So I had the Running Man in my back pockets. NBC's pounding on Vince. We got the Saturday Night Main, Alive, main event, and we signed it with Jesse Ventura. Where the hell is he? So Vince had to meet my demands, and not monetarily necessarily. That was the time when I was elected into the Pro, foot, pro Football, Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. They asked me that night what my greatest 
that I thought was my greatest contribution to wrestling, and I singled that out. I said my greatest contribution to wrestling was that I was the first wrestler in wrestling history to make Vince McMahon deal with an agent. And all the wrestlers today can thank me for whatever the conditions are they're wrestling under today, which I don't know exactly what they are because I don't watch wrestling anymore. Very rarely. Next question. By the way, there's all this rumor that the Arabs are going to buy the WWE. They're going to let Vince's women wrestlers wrestle over there like they're dressed. And they won't let women walk around without a mask on? That ought to be fun to see. <laughs> I guess the mighty dollar is more important than religion then, huh? Could What's be. the Ayatollah going to say to that? <laughs> we are in charge. Next question. Another Jeff. question. Do you believe in Bigfoot, or have you ever seen one? Um, do I believe in Bigfoot, and have I ever seen one? I don't know. I've never seen one, but I always, getting back to Andre, I always wanted to have some fun out in Oregon. I wanted to put Andre in a big gorilla suit and have him just run across the highway one night to where people see him run across the highway. I guarantee you, you'd have a dozen Bigfoot stories in the morning. We saw Bigfoot. No, I always wanted to do that with Andre when I was working Portland. Get Andre, put him in a big gorilla suit or something, and just hide along the freeway on I-5, and when it's just right, have him run across the freeway in this gorilla suit, and I guarantee, what else would they say it was? And I think then we'd have Bigfoot. <laughs> no, I, I have not seen anything that would, would indicate, have I seen Bigfoot? No. What about like flying birds, all kinds of crazy stuff out there? How about what? Par paranormal stuff out there. Have you, what have you seen? Or I, when I did conspiracy theory, we stayed away from UFOs and all of that. And I did that on purpose. I said, there's enough conspiracy theories by people down here. I'm not going to concern myself with aliens. I'll leave that for somebody else. And in fact, I'll quote Neil deGrasse Tyson, one of my heroes, the astrophysicist, when they asked Neil a couple weeks ago if there was life beyond Earth, and Neil's response was, well, he said, I'm sure going to be disappointed if there's not. And Ty, what was it Carl Sagan said? It'd be an awful waste of space if there ain't. Very true, very true. <laughs> Next question. So do I believe there's extra? Sure. I don't buy. You people need to know something else about me, and I'll come clean today. I'm agnostic atheist. Now, what is an agnostic atheist? That's someone who does not believe there's a supreme being, but you're open enough, if you can prove it, I'll believe it. No one's proven it yet. So... Neil deGrasse Tyson is an agnostic atheist, so am I. Until you can prove to me there's a guy in the sky, and I can't figure out, because I heard it defined once, God is a guy in the sky who wants your money. <laughs> now, I know the guy in the sky don't really want it, so there's interference somewhere in there <laughs> about the money end of it. And I was also asked once, if there was a heaven, and I got there, what one word would I like to hear, right? And I thought a moment, and I thought, I know what I'd like to hear if I got to heaven. I'd like to get there and hear someone scream out at the top of their lungs, four. <laughs> then I know there was golf. I'm good. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Another question over here. Next yeah. question's for Matt. So first I want to say my favorite outfit of yours is from Royal Rumble 1990, the Mickey Mouse get up. I have no idea what I even wore at Royal Rumble so 1990. So it was the Mickey Mouse sweater and the Mickey ears. 
Okay. It, I just love it. It's awesome. Yeah, Thanks. I'll believe you. <laughs> so, um, who is your favorite matches to call for back in the day? And I want to hear some good WrestleMania three stories. Uh, my favorite matches to call, I really didn't have favorites. I'll tell you the greatest match I ever saw in my life. Still, WrestleMania three, Ricky Steamboat against Macho Man was the greatest wrestling match I've ever watched in my career in life. It was phenomenal watching two of the greatest performers perform at the highest level possible in front of 93,000 people live. It was remarkable. It's something I'll never forget. And, uh, they, and, and Ricky and Mach had the best match. You know, the big headliner was Andre and Hulk, but uh, Andre was so elderly at the time, he was lucky he could get in there. He did a remarkable job for what he, for what he did and uh, for the business. But uh, Macho and, and Steamer were the greatest match I ever saw at WrestleMania three. But I can only say through six, because when I left, I didn't watch no more. You know, when I'm done with something, I leave it. I don't even know who wrestles today. I couldn't even name one. The only one I know, Ric Flair's daughter was wrestling, right? Yeah. That's about the only one I know. You know? That's questions right, from Kate. One. Yep. How are you doing, Jesse? Good. Good, good. Um, two questions, actually. What is the greatest technical wrestler that you got the experience of working with or calling matches for? Billy Robinson. Okay. Mine. Curtis, I think it was my all-time favorite. Um, and also, what do you think of the theory that no planes at all hit the World Trade Center buildings? What do I think of what now? I recently came across footage where, well, the planes in 9-11 actually underlap the buildings and looked like they were photo edited into it. Do you think that is possible? No. Okay. I mean, it's possible to do it. Right. They could make a picture like that, certainly. But you're asking me, is that what happened that day? No. 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 I mean, I've... I've Planes I've, hit the buildings. Except Trust me. There's a lot of other questions I got about it. But planes did hit the buildings. I, I'll, I, you know, I don't question that. But I have a lot of questions about 9-11 simply, and I'll tell you the major one. Half the people of America have no idea that a third building went down that day. How many people here know that a third building that wasn't struck by any plane, 49 stories high, collapsed at the, at the uh, rate of gravity? How many people here know that? See? Half of the room don't even know that. World Trade Center Building 7 collapsed that afternoon at 5.20, was not struck by any plane, and it went down in seconds to the ground. You had the 9-11 Commission, who felt that was so insignificant, it wasn't even mentioned in the entire 9-11 Commission report, that a third building went down that day. I, on conspiracy theory, we had a BBC reporter who we got standing in front of Building 7, and for five minutes she talks about a third, sending it back to Britain. A third building has fallen. World Trade Center Building 7, 49 stories, has collapsed to the ground. The entire broadcast she's doing, World Trade Center Building 7 still standing right behind her. It hasn't fallen yet. We wanted to talk to her and say, who told you it fell? Obviously, you weren't familiar because somebody with, with, who you great credibility to told you it had collapsed. And the reason we know the tape is wrong and all that is because on the tape, it says 4.50 p.m., World Trade Center Building 7 fell at 5.20. 30 minutes before it fell, this woman's already broadcasting that it's on the ground. BBC wouldn't let us talk to her. Uh-uh. Now, I think that deserves, as a tax-paying veteran of America, 
I think I deserve an answer on that. I think I'm entitled to know why a third building went to the ground, wasn't struck by any plane whatsoever, and then I can tell you another thing I learned. How many of you have ever heard of Sergeant April Gallup? Nobody. Well, I sat at a lunch counter with Sergeant Gallup, and uh, she was in the Pentagon when the alleged plane hit. You notice I said alleged on that one, because we've never seen the plane that hit the Pentagon, and yet they have cameras there 24-7, and it's a no-fly zone. How is it? Well, April looked me right in the eye. She's a sergeant, top secret security clearance, working in the Pentagon. She looked me right in the eye and said, Governor, there was no plane. She said the the room exploded. She said, initially, I thought I did it. She said, I was working on my computer. I hit this particular key, and the next thing I knew, the whole room exploded. She stumbled out the hole and was recovered on the ground out front. They took her and put her into 72 hours solitary confinement immediately. She couldn't talk to nobody. She told me there was no plane, there was no luggage, there was no seats, there was no bodies, there was no nothing on the alleged plane that hit the Pentagon. Now she was in the room. Do you think I ought to believe her? Or do you think she's bullshitting? And yet, they've never shown us the plane that hit the Pentagon, have they? And everything there is under camera. That's a no-fly zone. You can't fly over the Pentagon. They'll shoot you out of the air. Yet that day, nobody got shot out of the air, did they? So, yeah, I got a lot of questions. See, you people need to understand something, and I taught my son this. It's my son over there, the tall kid. And uh, you might recognize him. He worked with me on conspiracy theory. Anyway, though, I always tell my son now, Ty, you're in the presence of a genius. And my son always looks at me and kind of laughs and goes, oh, come on, Dad. How can you be a genius? I said, here's how. I said, I possess something today that is so rare that if you do possess it, it lifts you to genius status. And you know what that is that I possess? I possess something called common sense. And common sense is so rare today that if you do have it, you're a genius. You go to that level now because there's so many who don't. I feel sorry for them. They don't have any common sense. So when I look at 9-11, I apply common sense to things. And I go, well, why wouldn't this place has cameras all over? Why wouldn't they have a photo of this plane hitting the Pentagon? Why, Why wouldn't this stuff? Well, okay, the latest thing you got them, all these documents, right? Right? Trump has a ton of them. He gets caught, wants to hide them, isn't truthful. They're not charging him. Then they find some with Pence. They find some with Biden. You know what disturbs me? Since 2017, they have been breaking the law. In 2017, all documents pertaining to the murder of John F. Kennedy were to be released. They're still sitting on them. So the hell with these documents these three bozos have got. I want to see the Kennedy documents. You've been sitting on them for 60 years, and here's my argument. If Oswald really did it, and he was the lone nut they tell us he was, why would there be any documents on him? Let alone stuff you got to hold on to because of national security. How could a lone nut affect national security unless the lone nut worked for somebody and left a paper trail 
and it made people uncomfortable to find out that a coup d'etat happened that day. All very good questions to ask. Yeah. And you keep asking questions. Speaking of questions, any more questions for our, uh, for our guests Get right here? Get me now. I ain't coming back today. <laughs> if you don't do it now, forever hold your peace. Thank you for coming, Governor. Appreciate it. Uh, a quick question here. The uh, conspiracy theories yep. show. What led you to do that, and why did it end? Is that part of the reason why you're blacklisted? <laughs> well, I think it ended because it made too many people uncomfortable. Seriously. Uh, how did it come about? Well, it came about very much by what I showed you today. I was sitting, we were sitting out in L.A., and at the time I was with the William Morris Agency, and my agent was a power guy, Mark Idkin, and we were in a room, about six or eight people, and I went on a tirade for some reason about the murder of John Kennedy, and I started telling the truth and telling the things I knew, and the room stayed completely silent till I was done, and Mark Itkin looked around the room and said, ladies and gentlemen, he goes, this is a show waiting to happen. <laughs> you know, after hearing my tirade. So that's how conspiracy theory came about. <clears throat> Itkin then, you know, at William Morris, we got together with the production company. We sold our idea. Uh, we took it to True TV, we bought it. Unfortunately, True TV, wasn't fully capable of doing a show like that. So that gave some, excuse me, logistic problems. <coughs> excuse me, but we did. Maybe I'll take a drink of water. That might help. <laughs> uh, we did last, we did eight shows. We did eight shows a year. And we lasted three years. And... Today you cannot get them, and bear this in mind, they were highly rated, and they have never been shown in rerun, ever. And today, Man Cow, the disc jockey from Chicago, he had all of them on his computer, he came home and they were all systematically erased. They did what? Yeah, they came off of our DVR. Really? Yeah. Happened to you too? Yeah, and so I think that conspiracy theory, um, it made a lot of people uncomfortable that I was showing, the, shining the light on some things. And uh, I took a lot of heat for it. I will tell you this, I think I, think I got more attacked over conspiracy theory than I did beating the Democrats and Republicans for governor. I think conspiracy theory, you know, they ran an op on me. We have a question over here. Um, oh, good. Did I put you out there to ask that? <laughs> well, I joined the Navy at age 18, really for, I guess, lack of any better thing to do. Uh, I was a competitive swimmer in high school. I, had a, I was going to go to Bemidji State, which had a strong swim program in Minnesota, Bemidji State College up in Bemidji in the north. And that summer I started thinking about it and I thought, you're 18 years old. Do you really want to spend the next four years of your life in Bemidji, Minnesota? I'm from South Minneapolis. Bemidji's like the sticks. You know, I'm, I'm a city kid. And so I, my friend came over and talked me into joining the Navy on the buddy program. And we went down and enlisted in the Navy. And... Uh, uh, what was the rest of your question now? Okay. So after you enlisted, I know you served uh, you served uh, for about four and a half years. What did you get to do in the Navy that was 
Oh, well, in, well it, 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 yeah, plenty in the Navy. You, a lot of them I can't tell you about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, no, the, going into the Navy was really a challenge. You know what? Oh, I know what I'll back on track for. I went in at 18. I spent one complete year in training. Boot camp, A school, BUDS, which is six months, Army jump school, SEER school where I was waterboarded, escape, survival, escape, resistance, and evasion, whatever it was. And then what you go, call SEAL cadre, which you went out to Nyland, California, and you spent six to seven weeks out there running ops every night and shooting every handheld weapon known to man and learning how to clean it and learning everything about it. When you come out of SEAL cadre, for lack of better terms, you are a killing machine. You know nothing else. And I'm this, I turned, I turned 19 during this training. I then graduated from SEAL cadre on Wednesday. They said you're off till Monday morning. Be at Naval Air Station, North Island, Monday morning, you deploy to Saigon. Amazing. So I had, what, five days off? Jumped on, and get this. Here's a memory. Five days it took, because VR-21 that flew us is a prop plane. I had to fly to Southeast Asia on a prop plane. Thank God I was 19. <laughs> it's the only way you'd survive it. Anyway, though, getting back on track. I then did a nine-month deployment, Vietnam and other places. I returned to the America, my country, and I was back for five days. And I went into my executive officer, and I said, sir, I want to go back to Vietnam right now. And he looked at me and said, but you just got home. You just finished a nine-month deployment. He said, you can't go back. Navy regulations state you got to be at least six months out of the combat zone before you can go back in again. And then he looked at me and said, what's the problem? And I looked at him. I said, here's the problem, sir. I said, the problem is I've come home to my country and my country's told me I'm not a man. Incredible. <clears throat> They've told me I'm not a man because I can't go up on the street and drink a beer because I can't even vote for who sent me to Vietnam because the age limit then was still 21. So what did I deduce from that? The United States of America sends children to war. Isn't that child abuse? If you're old enough to potentially kill for your country or be killed for your country, you're an adult, man. And yet, I wasn't. I was still a child here. I still have PTS over that. Well, thank you. Thank you well, so much, Jesse. I don't want that. I appreciate it, but I don't. What I do want, I want this country to decide on an age. And the age is this. If you're old enough to kill or be killed for your country, that's the age of adulthood. If you deem that to be 21, then make it 21. But don't have it 18, you can go die. I always loved, we're not gonna see Kobe again. We're not gonna see LeBron James again. We're not gonna see a Kevin Garnett. Why? because they don't let kids go from high school to the NBA now. They think they need a year of college first. I loved what Jermaine O'Neal of the Pacers said. Jermaine come out and said, I'm confused. 
He said, you mean you can go die in Iraq, but you can't play basketball? <laughs> That's what they're saying, people. You're old enough to die in Iraq, but you ain't old enough to play basketball? In my day, I'm old enough to die in Vietnam, but I'm not even old enough to vote. Voting didn't come in until 18 at 70, 1972. I couldn't even vote. Now, I think I got a good case if I get a lawyer on child abuse here. <laughs> Would you classify that child abuse? You're not an adult and they sent you to war. What could be more abusive to a child except to sexually abuse them? Nothing. I can vouch for that, nothing. And yet, that's all I ask my country Pick the age and be consistent. Don't be hypocrites. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, I find it interesting that uh, the fact of the age situation is what really caught your eye, and I agree with you on that. As a former medic in Vietnam myself, I remember coming back and stopping in San Francisco for a kill stop before we ended up with a wire error. Sure, sure. Yep. And, you know, well, How did you feel about that to the age? I will tell you another veteran from the same war. Give him a round of applause. Um, and he asked the question about how we were treated when we came home. I can explain to you how I handled it. Uh, well, there's two things I did. <laughs> First one was this, in San Diego then, I actually saw law, so, signs on lawns that said, dogs and sailors keep off. Well, that didn't bother me too much, you know why? I'm a dog lover. And I thought, hell, I'm okay with the dogs. That's cool. You know, I know a lot of dogs I like better than people. <laughs> They're many times more loyal, you know. So, you know, I dealt with it that way. And uh, let's see, what was the par other part I was going to get to now? Dogs and people keep off. And, uh, but the main thing was, oh, here's the other part. It's like people today, when they ask me and thank me for my service, I always look at them and go, be in Vietnam, I go, I don't want to say to them, well, you're 40 years late, 50 years late because I'll make them feel bad. I always say to them, <laughs> oh, you don't have to thank me for my service. I said, I didn't do it for patriotism. I served because of the money. I said, God, when I went through Bud's, I was making $62 every two weeks. That's why, let me tell you this, that's, and I'll, you know, we'll take whatever more questions. That's why I've taken a position today. There should not be one billionaire in America. None. And I'll tell you why. Because there is nobody that works hard enough to earn a billion dollars. And my argument is this. The two jobs I did in my life that were physically the most demanding and mentally the most difficult that I ever did paid me the least amount of money. One was going through buds. And I challenge any billionaire to put up with six weeks of that shit at $62 every two weeks, you know. And the second was right before I went in the Navy. I had a job with the Minnesota Highway Department, a couple bucks above minimum wage. I worked for the bridge crew, and you know what my job was? I worked a four-day work week, 10 hours a day so I could have Friday, Saturday, Sunday for the weekend. You're 18, of course you're going to do that. But I worked 40 hours in four days on the bridge crew, and guess what I did? Ran the 80-pound jackhammer. I challenge any billionaire to, to run the jackhammer for 40 hours one week and tell me he works harder than that. No, he doesn't. 
That's why I believe there should not be a billionaire in the world. Absolutely. You didn't earn that money. Jesse, we're, I'm afraid we're out of time. <laughs> but this has been awesome. Well, I'll tell, if so we're much. out of time then, I'll tell everyone thank you for your patience. It's been great and fun. And uh, I don't know if I'm doing one tomorrow or not. They tell me my schedules and all that stuff when you get here. So I don't not, believe so, but visit him at his table. Absolutely. Yes. Well, anyway. Our, yes, to your feet, please. And on, on the presidential thing, hey, I'll push it back on you. It's up to you. You want me? Make it happen. If, if, if the people ask for me and demand me, I always say this, it always comes back to this thought in your mind, and especially for someone like me, and that is this. It always comes back to this. And it goes through my head. If not me, then who? <laughs> Who's going to do it? Thank you so much, Jesse. I'll guarantee, <laughs> I'll guarantee you this. Let me throw this at you. I was going to contact Donald Trump. <laughs> no, no, no. And I still might because by the time he's done, he may not be able to run. <laughs> and uh, here's the deal I want to do with Trump. I want Donald to agree with me to debate me on national television and we'll put it on pay-per-view. <laughs> Jesse Ventura versus Donald Trump in a one-on-one -on -one debate on anything. Anything. I think Donald and I could make a, he wouldn't have to fundraise no more. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for watching this video. I am Invader Zim, and I traffic in doom. And so, if you do not subscribe to this channel, you will have doom that befalls you by me, Invader Zim.